Hey class, uh, just a reminder, uh, next Tuesday we're going to have our second exam. The format will be the same as the first. You'll uh, be given the exam on Tuesday uh, afternoon, early evening, uh, and uh, you'll have a, a week to complete it. Uh, same bonus property, so it'll be a, a five-point bonus question, then an additional five points for uh, students who complete their work in LaTeX. Uh, I will provide an exam review uh, and I will get that out uh, today or no later than tomorrow. Uh, and then there will be a homework uh, that'll be due. Uh, it'll be made available uh, this evening uh, and then it will be due uh, next Tuesday. Uh, on Thursday, uh, I'll try and keep the lecture light. We'll uh, do a review of uh, some of the content of the uh, of the exam uh, review <laughs> and uh, and uh, we'll um, uh, have a, a brief discussion uh, leading into the, the third part of the course which is um, proofs and, and ways to attack them and uh, it, just uh, a general approach to um, it, to uh, churning your way uh, through these problems uh, where uh, you have to uh, be a little creative uh, or persistent uh, in order to uh, create a solution. Uh, okay, so for this problem, uh, we're or for today, uh, we're gonna um, program a, a solution uh, to uh, minimum spanning trees uh, using both Prem's algorithm and Kruskal's algorithm. Uh, and the graph that we're going to use is uh, taken, borrowed from the book. Uh, and so uh, the letters are the vertices, uh, and the, the numbers above each edge are the weights for that edge. Um, and then we're going to construct uh, two minimum spanning trees uh, that generates a tree from, from this. Uh, and as with anything that deals with graphs, whenever you're manipulating it, uh, there's two approaches that you'll encounter. Uh, and so one of them is uh, vertex centered, and that's Prem's algorithm. So you start with a vertex, uh, and then you uh, travel to another vertex. Uh, and so if you, uh, well, uh, it, it suggests uh, starting with a, a pair of vertices uh, where there's a, a minimum weight. Uh, and so uh, it could be B and F, uh, it could be C and D, uh, and then it could be K and L. Uh, and then to spread out, from that. So let's say that we picked uh, edge C and D. So then our minimum spanning tree includes a relationship between C and D uh, and uh, that edge that joins them. Uh, and so for Prim, uh, we consider all of the edges uh, that are uh, adjoining to the, the vertices that are already included in our tree. Uh, so here we have one of weight three, one of weight two, and one of weight five. And Prim's algorithm says, okay, well, uh, we're expanding our tree from everything that's already been included, uh, and we're always going to pick the, uh, the vertex uh, who, uh, with the, the minimum cost to reach it from wherever we are. Uh, and so you grow the tree vertex by vertex. Uh, so we started with C and D uh, of the edges that touch the ones that are already included in our tree. Two is the least weight. Uh, and so now we have D, C, and G in our tree. Uh, and then from there, same rule. Uh, okay, well, what's the least weighted edge attached to the, the tree that we have, that we've grown thus far? Uh, B and C. Uh, and then from there, we would get B and F because that's a weight one, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so the algorithm is pretty easily understood. You're growing it. You start by some minimum weighted edge, and that ties together two vertices uh, and those two vertices represent and that edge represent the tree you have this far and then you grow it always adding uh, the minimum edge uh, that uh, that doesn't uh, create a, uh, a circuit so uh, you start with a graph you're growing a tree you start with something that very much resembles a, a very tiny tree a, a root and <laughs> one child uh, it doesn't actually say which vertex should be the root, uh, but you know you can pick. <laughs> it, it doesn't really matter. 
the guarantee is that you're going to have a graph that is also a tree, um, but you would have to essentially pick the root later on. Uh, and uh, th that part is, is not so difficult. I'll, I'll let you uh, <laughs> come up with ways to, to determine what could be a root. Um, but really, uh, you know, I guess uh, the simplest explanation would be just pick one of the two that you started with, and that's the root. Um, but uh, we're not so concerned about turning our graph into uh, our uh, our tree into a rooted tree as we are turning our graph into a tree with these two algorithms. Uh, okay, so that's prem, and that's the vertex-centered approach. So you're growing it vertex by vertex. Um, Kruskal's algorithm, uh, it has the same condition, uh, except that we're growing it edge by edge. So that one says, uh, sort each of the edges, uh, and then uh, pick the minimum weighted edge that doesn't cause uh, a, uh, the, a circuit to be created or that doesn't break the conditions of a, a tree. Uh, and so uh, here we would start with this edge and then this edge and then this edge. Um, and then uh, next we would have this edge and then this edge. Uh, and then we would start going by all the three weights. Uh, and so Oh, sorry, then this edge. Uh, and then we would, uh, I think we could add, we could add each of the three weighted ones. Um, but then whenever we get to the fours, we have to uh, be careful um, because uh, we, we can't create a circuit. Uh, and so the difficulty with these problems uh, is uh, how are we going to guarantee that as we're choosing our next edge that we we don't break the tree condition and that is that there are no no circuits that uh, that everything has a distinct path back to you know whatever root uh, well it, it doesn't even have to be a root uh, but that there's only one way to reach um, uh, to travel from node to node uh, that there is a unique path that connects every pair of nodes in the, the tree um, and so we can't violate that condition, otherwise we don't have a tree. Um, and so uh, you know, the, the motivation for this, like a, a minimum spanning tree, uh, let's say, uh, you know, again, we're considering networks. Um, so we have a, a graph to start with, and, and there's all of these interceding uh, you know, relays and switches and routers and so forth. Uh, and we want, uh, we want to reach every network or if you want to consider these uh, you know the routers of subnetworks then we want to reach every subnetwork uh, with you know whatever message we're we're broadcasting uh, or we're communicating to our subscribers and we want to do it with the minimum burden on the network uh, well that's you know one motivation for a minimum spanning tree uh, and so you, know, you want to establish these routes of minimum cost uh, and uh, they would uh, be non-wasteful. You don't want your, your packet circulating around. Uh, you want it to go to reach its destination with the, the minimum time delay and the minimum cost on the network. Um, so that's one motivation for a spanning tree. So, uh, okay. So now we know, or, or we should have a, a gist of the idea of the difference between the vertex-centered uh, Prim's algorithm and the edge-centered uh, Kruskal's algorithm. And uh, though they may generate uh, different trees, the weight of the tree and the total weight of all the edges included in the trees generated by these two algorithms will be the same. Uh, and so in that regard, they both generate a minimum spanning tree. Uh, okay, so let's jump to it. So we'll be using Java for this one. Uh, and uh, for that, we're going to use NetBeans. Um, and you can just Google NetBeans download, uh, and it's the current release is 12.1. Uh, and the version that I have is uh, the the long-term service release uh, 12 with the update with the first update. Um, and so it, I tend to get the the, the latest uh, stable version of whatever it is that I'm working with. So uh, that's the version that I'll be working with. Uh, okay, so we need to generate a new project. Uh, so we'll go Java with Ant, although we're not going to use Ant. Uh, and uh, um, 
and so ant I believe is an automated build script uh, yeah uh, so if we are using uh, ant then it's happening transparently uh, and in fact I, I feel like I already need to backtrack say that we're not using it I'm pretty sure that it is going to use it and manage it automatically for us uh, so yeah we'll be using that uh, and then uh, Java application and that's the, the console version of uh, what we're doing uh, although I think you could use the swing or uh, yeah the swing libraries uh, and those would allow you to create a, a user interface if you want uh, but we are uh, we're just dealing with console applications because that's uh, the kind of the best way to get started and uh, whenever I have you do anything with a, an interface, uh, a user interface, it'll either be console-based uh, or um, uh, web-based. Uh, so you're dealing with HTML and JavaScript and CSS, I guess, uh, which we, we haven't really discussed much. Um, okay, uh, so the application uh, will be, um, we'll call it spanning trees. Okay, and it'll create the package for us and the main class. Uh, okay. And then let me zoom in. Uh, okay, so our source will be managed here. Uh, and then any external libraries we rely on would be included here. But um, we uh, will keep pretty much the, uh, the base classes. Uh, I think we'll use java.util and java.lang, maybe, although I don't think we actually need that one. I think that uh, it's for something else that I decided not to use. Um, okay, uh, so uh, the first thing we need to do uh, is, is make sure uh, that we can uh, call hello world or, or construct hello world, because uh, as I've said before, if uh, you're developing a new project and you can't get uh, Hello World to work, then uh, you, you have a, a little bit of work in front of you before you can even really begin uh, working on your project. Uh, okay, so the way to print to the console uh, in Java is via system.out.println, uh, and that's the C equivalent of C out. F, I believe, with C, and there's a formatted print and some uh, some similarities to C. So if you are familiar with C style syntax, then you have a, a lot of languages at your disposal. Uh, okay, uh, so really, we just want to get started with this, uh, and then run it. Hello world. All right, we're in business. Uh, okay, so now uh, what we need. I'll change this to say that our work is completed. Uh, and we'll lay out uh, the goals. Uh, so we need to uh, create a graph, initialize our vertices, uh, initialize our edges, Uh, and then uh, generate the spanning trees. Uh, okay, so the first thing we're going to need is uh, a graph, and graphs are constructed from vertices and edges. Um, so before we even need our, our first thing, we already need something else, uh, and we need a, a vertex. need to name our vertex uh, and so in C sharp uh, we'll occasionally use something that's private read only uh, and then a type uh, but uh, the equivalent in Java or <laughs> since I think Java probably came first in this uh, would be final uh, and 
that is uh, something that you can initialize in a constructor or uh, optionally, I think, in uh, the initializer mode here. Um, uh, but uh, you can't edit it once it's been um, once it's been set, uh, and so that is an overload. Uh, whenever you're dealing with inheritance, um, you can. Uh, or I, I believe it's an overload, but conceptually, uh, there's a, an equivalent. Whenever you're dealing with inheritance, with class inheritance. Uh, where you're, you can seal it or mark it as final. Uh, I can't remember the, the Java syntax off the top of my head. Um, and that means that you can no longer uh, create subclasses from, from that particular inheritance branch. Um, but in this context, uh, assuming that uh, it is overloaded, but definitely in this context, it means that you can set it once uh, and then you won't be able to set it again later on. So let's see if that's true. Uh, ooh, does it mark that as an error? Uh, can I assign value to final? Yeah. Uh, so you only get one chance to set it. Uh, and I didn't even mean to declare this as edge. Uh, we want this to be the name. So the name will be passed in in the constructor, we'll assign it once, and that is forever the name of that vertex instance. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, we need a, a way to retrieve the name. We can only set it the once, but we need to provide a, a getter. Uh, okay, uh, and then uh, we need a two string. Uh, and so this is a formatted string. It's very similar to sprintf uh, in C. Um, so it should look at least a little familiar. Uh, we're going to pull in a string from the first argument, uh, and then uh, we'll indicate the degree of the vertex with the second argument. And then for now, we'll just say that the degree is zero. Uh, and once we have the concept of an edge, then we can define a degree. Uh, so let's go ahead and define that. immutable data types uh, so we're uh, and by that I mean it can't be changed because we're sealing it with final or we're uh, we're restricting uh, the number of times that it can be assigned uh, and in general this is a, a pretty good programming practice uh, you want to make sure that uh, your assumptions are not being uh, swept away from underneath you uh, while the program is executing so if you want to be able to prove that your work is algorithmically correct, uh, then in order to have valid assumptions, you need to make sure that your data, uh, once it's it's verified, uh, is not changed, uh, or you know, if it's not verified, that it's at least meeting uh, certain restrictions, um, which I guess it would have to be verified in order to do. <laughs> uh, but uh, our, our restrictions are by data type, um, but we can uh, add some additional stuff. Uh, okay, uh, and so um, <laughs> already I'm going to take some, some shortcuts uh, because of my lack of familiarity, familiarity with Java. Uh, so in Java, one of the things that, that makes it great uh, is also one of the things that makes it uh, uh, a little um, uh, more restrictive. Um, so let's say that we want to check our, our data types right here. Uh, so 
So we want to make sure uh, that name uh, is not equal to, does this have a, an empty string? Uh, okay, uh, so we're throwing an exception and you can see that it's modified the signature. Uh, so this is a, a constructor signature, but it's a constructor is just a special type of method um, that uh, <laughs> that is associated with allocating memory and, and returns the, the data type uh, that is defined for. Uh, and so it's right here in the constructor signature uh, that we're going to be throwing an exception and the type of exception. Um, so uh, I would prefer it to be something like argument exception. I don't know if it's going to allow me to do that. Uh, yeah, we'd have to create the class for it. Uh, so that's fine. We don't need that. We can keep it a generic exception. Um, but in order now to instantiate an edge, uh, anywhere that we instantiate it, we would need to include a, a try-catch block for the creation of that edge. Um, and yeah, I <laughs> there's a, a, a psychological phenomenon uh, that uh, whenever there are eyes on someone, they always do the they do the perceived morally right thing. Uh, so I guess I'll go ahead and do that now. <laughs> now that you're watching, uh, so. Um, so yeah, we've declared that we'll throw this exception type and we'll include the try catch block and uh, it may slow us down a little bit. Uh, but this is, while it's uh, slightly more tedious to have to declare the exceptions that are being thrown, uh, on the one hand, it's fantastic on the other hand because you will never encounter an unexpected exception. Java enforces it at the compiler level uh, that you provide handling uh, and, and that you are made aware uh, in the method signature uh, for all of the types of exceptions that can be thrown by the methods uh, you call. So it's possible to forward the exception and that's fine, but you have to be declarative in doing so. Uh, and so uh, you're always aware in Java what types of exceptions are possible. Uh, and, and from a developer standpoint, that's, that's really great. Um, and it's also really tedious uh, sometimes, but uh, you know it's fine. So uh, in this way, we protect the integrity of our data. Um, so let's go ahead and keep it. Uh, okay, uh, name parameter uh, cannot be empty. Uh, and then uh, we'll do the same thing. Uh, so. Uh, so if source is equal to null uh, or dest is equal to null, we'll throw an exception. Uh, vertices may not be null. weight has to be uh, uh, strictly positive. You can't have a weight that's zero or negative. Uh, so we'll enforce that here. Okay, so now we have assumptions that we can operate under, uh, that we're dealing with a, a weighted graph uh, where the weights are positive, uh, our vertices, both source and destination on an edge, uh, are non-null. And, and I want to emphasize that these are 
uh, undirected graphs that we're going to be working with. So the concept of a, a source and destination, um, it, uh, it's uh, commutative, so it, it really doesn't matter which one we spec specify. Uh, I just needed some way to uh, distinguish first node from second node for the edge. Uh, and source and destination is a concept that uh, if you switch to weighted graphs, uh, those the, the concept translates. Uh, you just have to understand that it, for what we're dealing with, um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but we will have to account for the fact that whenever we look up an edge, uh, we need to be able to go in either order because it's an undirected graph. Uh, so we'll deal with that later. Uh, okay, uh, so now we assign our uh, our uh, class properties. Um, so name uh, source dest and weight. Uh, just like before, we have to provide getters. Oh, I forgot to declare the time. Weight and of course our uh, two string, which we should always be specifying. Uh, and so this part should look a little like the C sharp one that we did, uh, except we would have override here. However, in Java, the override uh, is declared as an attribute. Uh, above the method. Uh, okay, uh, so then we want to return our string. Uh, we're going to use a formatted string. Uh, okay, uh, and so we'll have the the name, uh, and then uh, some of the properties on the edge that would help us uh, understand what we're looking at. Uh, and then, as a habit, I tend to end my two strings with uh, inline characters so that whenever I'm printing it out, um, it always has an inline in the appropriate place and I don't have to uh, mess with it too much in the string builder notation. Uh, but uh, this <laughs> uh, the, the usefulness of these two string methods uh, may uh, be very limited. Because uh, as you'll see when we get to it, when we develop the graph, uh, we are going to uh, print out uh, adjacency and incidence uh, matrices, since that's uh, perhaps the easier way to consume uh, information in a graph. Uh, okay, so now we have an edge. Um, what we should do is uh, keep track of it. Uh, so the edge has a reference to the two vertices that it's a uh, adjoining. Uh, the, vertic the vertices should have a, a collection of edges uh, that it's um, adjacent or that define its adjacencies. So uh, we need to import java.util.star. Uh, we don't necessarily need the dot star but we need uh, the concept of a, an array list. Um, I think we could declare it as a list as well but we'll declare it as an array list. Uh, and so in Java, uh, whenever you deal with a 
generics or the templates, I, I can't remember what they call them in this language, uh, you don't have to repeat uh, the, the data type here, uh, it, if it, especially if it's implied. So if it's the same as what you're dealing with here, then, then you don't need to repeat it. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so now we have that. Uh, we need some way of adding edges. So let's, pro let's expose a method that will allow edges to be added. Uh, and then uh, because we have a collection, um, well, uh, let's, let's not add it unless we need it. I was going to say we could expose an iterator, uh, but we don't necessarily want that. Uh, okay, so we can add edges here. Um, actually, yeah, we will need the iterator uh, because whenever we're using uh, Prim's algorithm, which uh, creates a, a collection of accessible edges based on the vertices that are included in the tree, uh, we're going to need a, a method of iterating over the collection of the edges associated to a given vertex. So let's go ahead and expose the iterator. Uh, okay, uh, and then we can modify this down here. So we're no longer dealing with a constant degree of zero. Uh, we actually have uh, a collection that we can query to see how many edges uh, are actually um, uh, adjoining uh, our given vertex to neighboring vertices. Uh, okay, uh, so we have that, we have our edge. Uh, does it still compile? It does, ran successfully. Uh, okay, so then the last uh, new class that we'll need uh, is a graph. Uh, and we're going to use collections again in this one. Uh, so we'll need java.util. Uh, locally, we're going to maintain a dictionary or hash map, uh, which maps uh, a, uh, a vertex name to a vertex. So we can look up uh, vertex instances by name. Uh, and then we want to be able to do the same thing with edges. What was it complaining about? Uh, unused. Okay, well, that'll go away. That should be final. Uh, and then finally, we have some uh, non final elements, but we'll wait to add them until. We'll wait to add those uh, properties uh, until we actually need them. Uh, okay, so we have our constructor. Uh, our graph will have a name. Uh, and then we'll initialize the vertices and edges as new hash maps. We need to provide some way of adding a new vertex. Uh, and we should get uh, we should get an error here saying that we're not handling uh, the exception that we're throwing. Oh, okay. 
Uh, maybe it'll just be a warning. Oh, uh, the exception was on edges, right? Exception. No exception. Okay, so we'll deal with it over there. Uh, okay. Printing out our adjacency matrix, where uh, <laughs> we'll need a, a reference to the string length. Uh, for now, I'll just leave a, a comment that we need to add something for. Uh, two vertices, uh, VN edge. Uh, and again, we'll borrow the syntax of sourced and destination ID. Uh, but really, um, we, uh, we don't care which order <laughs> they come in. Uh, we need to be able to look it up in either direction. But we'll handle that uh, in the getter method for edges. Uh, and uh, as we're storing them, uh, we'll uh, we'll keep source and destination distinct. with that since we just created it. Uh, edge ID will be constructed from uh, formatted string. Uh, and the format that we're going to use uh, if we're connecting vertices A and B is going to be A underscore B. Uh, so instead of uh, E1, E2, E3, uh, it'll be of the form uh, A, B, A, C, and so forth. reason for that is that it makes looking it up a lot easier. Uh, if you know the names of the vertices, uh, then you can easily recreate this string uh, and then look in our dictionary for edges uh, for that string to see whether or not that edge exists. Uh, and in that way you can tell whether or not uh, two edges or two vertices have been connected already. Um, and if they have, you can easily retrieve it. Uh, okay. Uh, then now we create our edge instance, uh, and I believe this is where it'll actually uh, complain to us that we're not handling the exception. Uh, okay, um, so uh, I say that we just uh, throw it uh, if the uh, edges, if the vertices don't um, don't exist, uh, well, we're not creating the vertices here, we're just retrieving them. Uh, so uh, that should really be uh, just forwarded to whoever's invoking this method. Uh, and uh, it should be checked at that point, uh, or handled at that point if it hasn't, uh, if it doesn't exist. Uh, but whoever's calling connect vertices is really who needs to be made aware 
uh, that those vertices don't exist, not this method. Uh, so, uh, okay. Now, We make the vertices aware that they've been joined to other vertices uh, via this new edge instance. Uh, and that'll uh, allow us to keep track of the degree of the, uh, of the vertex and so forth. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, so just pass the reference to the vertex. Uh, and then for formatting purposes. And then we return the new edge instance uh, that was created as part of this method. Uh, okay, uh, so now we need a way to retrieve uh, edge instances uh, and vertex instances, actually. follow our standard format, get whatever it is that we're looking for. Vertex. Uh, and just calling it vertex ID. Uh, so then we just return So that one's pretty straightforward. <laughs> uh, and then um, the edge. So for that one, we need a source and a destination. Uh, and it accepts uh, the, the vertices themselves. Um, we could, uh, here we have a choice. We can uh, create a, an overloaded method, one that accepts vertices and one that accepts strings, um, or we can just choose. Uh, let's uh, change this to use the IDs. Um, just because uh, if you have the vertex instance, then it's easy enough to, uh, to get the uh, the ID, but if you have the ID, uh, you would have to call this vertex otherwise. Uh, but we're just constructing strings, so um, we don't actually need the vertex instance. We just need its ID. Uh, so then, in order to return it, uh, we have to deal with the fact that uh, source and destination uh, here might be specified in a different order than it was whenever we were connecting it over here. Uh, so uh, we have to define it in both directions. So the edge ID uh, forward would actually be the same as over here. Uh, and then the edge ID in reverse, or in swapped order, just be uh, the reverse order of those IDs. So dest would come first over here and then source second. Uh, okay. So now we can check uh, whether or not our uh, dictionary or our hash map contains the key uh, whenever we keep it in the same order that it was specified. Uh, or 
stuff in the slots. to iterate over anything uh, presumably we would iterate over the edges but it's ambiguous because we have two collections uh, so are we going to uh, iterate over the vertices or over the edges uh, so uh, we can't just define a, a blanket iterator but we can uh, create one for both vertices and edges uh, so as a convenience uh, we can provide it um, and it, I'll show you what it would look like and then I'm going to delete it uh, because uh, you don't want to specify anything until you know for sure that you're going to need it. Uh, edges iterator. So you reach in and you get the values collection uh, and then you return the iterator there. Okay, uh, but uh, we don't know for sure that anything is actually going to consume that, uh, and it's not uh, it's not strictly necessary to expose it. Uh, whereas the vertices and the edges, the only way to retrieve it is this uh, this way. So there is some convention. Um, you can make an argument that the iterator would also be uh, a convention, uh, and if you do, then you can go ahead and provide it. Uh, but for now, I want to keep the code uh, simple because. Um, because you're using it instructionally and I want to make sure that it's uh, as little code as necessary uh, and anything that we're defining and not using is a little bit confusing. Um, so, uh, okay, so that's great. Um, let's see if we still have something that runs. It does, fantastic. Uh, okay, so the next thing, oh, I'm sorry, did I not zoom that one in? Okay, well, going forward, it'll be zoomed in. Uh, okay, uh, so let's see how much of what we know that we need we can actually still complete and have uh, code that runs. Uh, so the first thing uh, is to create a graph. We'll call it G1. Uh, and we'll call it that because that's the name we're giving it internally. Uh, so we create it. Does it run? Yes. Excellent. So now we initialize the vertices. Uh, so G1 is going to get a new vertex. Um, and uh, we did it alphabetically. If you remember the graph that I showed you on the whiteboard, uh, we defined A through L. So let's go ahead and do that again. B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, okay, let's see if we still have something that runs. It automatically saved it for me, which was nice. Uh, okay, still ran, still completed. Uh, let's see if we can connect edges. Or connect vertices. Uh, okay, so the ID is going to be the name of the vertex that we defined up here. Uh, and it's just letters, so that's not so bad. Uh, we're connecting A to B at a cost of 2. And what's it complaining about? All right, so now we have to decide whether or not our, our main method is going to throw uh, an exception uh, or if we're going to surround it with a try catch. Um, so let's just surround it with a try catch. Uh, and then uh, we're not actually logging anything, so let's just print out that it happened. Yeah, we don't need any of that information. We're going to say explicitly what happened. Um, so, uh, unable to complete uh, graph initialization. Uh, 
and then we'll provide one additional detail. Failed while attempting to connect to a non-existent vertex. Uh, okay, so now, um, now we can go about our business <laughs> and stick everything else inside this try catch, uh, and it'll the block will work uh, all the same. We won't know which vertices didn't exist. We would have to go in and look at it later. Uh, we could attempt to get the information from the exception. We could create separate try catch blocks for each of them. We could create a, a method uh, similar to connect vertices defined here, some static method uh, that would uh, wrap the try catch and then it would spit out based on the, the names that we passed into the method uh, that it would spit out the vertex names that we attempted to connect and we would know from that which one uh, failed. Uh, but for now we're just looking for some blanket statement. The program is small enough and we're still uh, we're more than uh, getting something that can live on correctly forever and spit out accurate logs. Uh, we're testing the the logic of our program, which right now is is strictly just data representation. We have the concept of a vertex, the concept of an edge, and the concept of a graph, which is composed of vertices and edges. Uh, but we're not actually asking it to do anything just yet. We haven't defined an algorithm. We're just creating some uh, programmatic representation uh, of these concepts. Uh, okay, so uh, the next <laughs> data that we want to include uh, is the edge uh, that connects A to E. Again, refer to that graph I showed at the beginning. Um, so we have A to E, uh, B connected to C, uh, and that was weighted 3. Uh, B was connected to F as well in the second row, uh, and that edge had a weight of 1. C was connected to D with an, a weight of 1. It was also connected to G uh, with a weight of 2. Uh, D was connected to H uh, with a weight of 5. Uh, and uh, notice that C was connected to D, but I didn't specify DC. Uh, and that's because if we want to look it up in the other direction, we already have that convenience method, the get edge, uh, where we can pass it in in either order. Uh, and it'll look it up by the pair um, and return that edge. Uh, and so we only want to define the edge once. Uh, now if we wanted to be even more strict in constructing our graph, uh, then whenever we connected the vertices, uh, in addition to, uh, to our constructor new edge, where we made sure that the vertices were not null, uh, we would uh, add a, an additional check to make sure that uh, that our, our graph was simple and that is that uh, we didn't specify two we didn't connect the same vertices twice uh, and so whenever we uh, oh actually looking this up I see already that we have a, a problem we're not actually uh, putting the new edge into our uh, our hash map, um, which we should be doing, uh, that should go right here. Okay. Uh, so, um, so yeah, let's go ahead and correct that. Uh, so we'll add a check. Uh, so we have our edge ID. Uh, and whenever we're returning it, we check the forward and the reverse. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and construct a reverse edge ID. So we have edge ID, and we'll construct a reverse edge ID. Uh, and we'll say that if uh, our, our dictionary, our hash map, uh, our 
already has a reference to the reverse edge ID, then we're going to throw an exception. say uh, simple graphs may uh, only connect a pair of vertices 0 or 1 times. Uh, well, it's not connected if it's connected zero times. So we'll say it'll only connect a pair of vertices uh, once. Uh, okay, so now we have an exception there. Uh, and we're guaranteed that for any pair of vertices connected by an edge, that uh, it only exists once in our edges collection. Uh, so, uh, so we're now enforcing that. Uh, we're piggybacking on the fact that uh, we're already throwing an exception, uh, and as a result of that, uh, this is already uh, contained inside a try-catch block. Uh, so if we did attempt to connect C, uh, D to C here, then we would get an exception. And uh, maybe we can try that out. Um, but now uh, we no longer know which exception we're dealing with here. Uh, so I think what we should do uh, is to print out the exception message. And then we'll see what message was included uh, in the constructor whenever we uh, attempted to connect to the vertices. So, uh, just to make sure that we're throwing it in the appropriate places, uh, we should try uh, passing in null as one of these, uh, or something that doesn't exist. Uh, okay. So D connected to H, uh, and then uh, E connected to F, and it had a weight of 4. Uh, it also connected to I, and that had a weight of 4. Uh, F was connected to G, and that had a weight of 3. F was connected to J, uh, and that had a weight of 2. Uh, and then G had two additional connections. G was connected to H, and G was connected to K. Connection to H cost 3, and the one to K cost 4. H connected to L, 3, I connected to J at 3, uh, J connected to K with a cost of 3, uh, and then K connected to L with a cost of 1. Uh, okay, so let's run it. Make sure our stuff compiles and runs. Okay, excellent. Uh, and then uh, now we need some way of witnessing what it is that we've actually constructed. Um, we'll quickly test to see whether or not uh, we're getting exceptions as anticipated. Uh, so we ran it once. It worked. Now we're going to try something we expect to break. Vertices may not be null. Okay, it broke exactly as we wanted it to. That's excellent. Um, so we can comment that out. Uh, vertices may not be null, again. Uh, and then uh, the one that says duplicate edges 
simple graphs may only connect a pair of vertices once. Uh, okay, so uh, we got that exactly as we wanted. Um, so now uh, the guarantee of uh, our data integrity is actually inside here. Uh, so unless we uh, return, or return right here, uh, then uh, we have to put our the rest of our logic inside the try-catch block. But uh, I would rather uh, short-circuit the program here um, with just the error message if necessary. So let's get one of those error messages back. Uh, okay, and so anything that executes outside of the try-catch block or, or following the try-catch block is guaranteed uh, that no exception was thrown inside because we, we leave the method if that happens. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, so now we need some way of printing out what it is we're looking at. Uh, and I think the easiest way to do that uh, is to create uh, an adjacency or incidence matrix. Uh, so let's go into the graph uh, and we'll add uh, those. It's like a two string and I'm always encouraging you to create the two string methods. Um, Actually, uh, these can be public. I don't know why I make them private. Okay, everything else is public. Excellent. Uh, okay. So we create our method name. Uh, and. Um, In order to do this, uh, we're going to need two new variables uh, in order to create the formatted string as expected. Uh, I'll explain them to you whenever we encounter <laughs> where they are. Uh, okay, so first we need a string builder because uh, we're going to do this uh, vertex by vertex, you know, row by row. Uh, so we want to label what it is that we're displaying. Uh, and then in an adjacency matrix, the vertices and the uh, are the label for both the top and the bottom. Uh, so we want to print them along the top. be a, we're appending a, a formatted string, uh, and that'll be of the form uh, space uh, percent one to indicate that it's the first variable, uh, and then uh, the dollar sign is a, a width, or an indicator that we're going to give a width to our string. Uh, so if we wanted it to be 10 characters or 10 spaced characters, uh, we would do that. Um, Let's just make it uh, three characters for now, uh, and then I'll show you a way to maintain it dynamically later. But three should be sufficient. Uh, okay, uh, and then we want a space at the end. Uh, and then, yeah. Okay, so whenever we're formatting that, uh, we have our formatted string. Um, vertex formatted string. Okay, uh, and then we want, uh, I guess, a, an additional space. And all we're pulling in is the space. <laughs> Uh, so what we're doing here is creating filler. So whenever, if, if you remember whenever you did it uh, earlier or whenever I've shown you the uh, adjacent, the labeled adjacency matrix, uh, the there's space at the beginning of, of the matrix um, where you account for 
the the braces and uh, the labeling to the left of the matrix. Um, and so this all of this white space here is accounting for that. Uh, and we may have to adjust it to get it correct. Uh, this is the equivalent of a, a for each loop. Uh, so we're saying for every vertex uh, inside of vertices.values, uh, we're going to execute this. And it's just constructing our string. Uh, and again, we're borrowing our format string. And uh, we're going to use the vertex name, uh, and we're going to pad it with white space uh, to make sure that it always takes up at least three characters of space, um, or three columns of space when printed. Uh, okay, and I think I'm running a little bit long, so uh, I'll. <laughs> spare you <laughs> some of the details of, of doing this, but uh, we're going to go row by row uh, and uh, we're going to append uh, the text. Uh, so it'll be the weighted edges within uh, and then it'll be um, the vertex name before we go column by column. Uh, so vertex format string uh, uses a variable that we haven't declared just yet. Uh, it uh, uses max vertex string length. Uh, and we can track that here. I was saying for formatting purposes, we're going to add a variable. Uh, so we'll add that for both the uh, vertex and the edge. Um, we'll say, OK, well, the string representation, or the, the vertex ID has a length and uh, if, uh, if it exceeds whatever the, the maximum length to that point is, then go ahead and mark that. And so essentially every column in our printed matrix will always have uh, that maximum length uh, so that they're all a standard width. Uh, and then we're going to do the same thing with edges. the name and not the vertex. Okay, but aside from that, it works. Uh, so uh, we go across the top uh, and we, we add to our string all of the, uh, the vertex names on the top row. Uh, and then we do a new line character. Uh, and then row by row, uh, we're going to go and create a, a matrix entry, a matrix row for every vertex uh, in our graph. Uh, and so uh, we'll do the, the vertex name, uh, and it'll be three columns wide, although really I should be using this instead of this. you can anticipate that it'll be about three spaces wide. Uh, and so, uh, and then we'll do this to mark the beginning of the matrix. Uh, and then we'll have uh, the weight for the, <laughs> the edge that connects the row and column. Uh, and you'll see, and if you create an adjacency matrix from what I showed you earlier, uh, you'll see that it lines up with this. Uh, but let's make sure, uh, so let's go in uh, and we'll print out um, we'll print out what we have so far.
Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, okay, so this is that white space that I was telling you about earlier, so you have to account for that. Uh, and then, yeah, it looks like it lines up. So these are the columns. Uh, and rather than having a zero uh, if it's not connected and a one if it's connected, uh, we're leaving it blank if it's not connected. Uh, and uh, that's not, um, you know, it, it's weighted, so this is correct. Uh, but the question is uh, how you represent two edges that aren't connected. So you could use zero because it has to be strictly positive. Uh, but zero is misleading. It implies a weight of zero. A negative value implies a weight of negative. Uh, and if we were to insert uh, the infinity symbol, uh, we'd see that it messes up our formatting, <laughs> which is why uh, we've, uh, I've made the decision uh, to leave it blank. It gets the point across. It shows uh, you know, what, uh, essentially what's going on uh, with these weights. Uh, and uh, it, the formatting comes out looking all right. Um, so it's, it's still obvious what's going on here uh, with each of these. Uh, okay, so the adjacency matrix looks good. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and construct uh, an incidence matrix uh, so we can see that. Uh, and then we will uh, quite rapidly <laughs> implement Kruskal and uh, Prim. And we're going to be over on time probably by about 20 minutes, I would say. Um, so I do apologize for that. Uh, the next class uh, ought to be a bit shorter, I would imagine. Um, but uh, as you can see, there's a fair amount of work just getting the representation correct. And then uh, you want to be able to see that what you've constructed is correct, um, which is why we went through the trouble of creating the adjacency matrix and the incidence matrix. Uh, and it's because there isn't an obvious way to do a two-string for the graph. Um, so this is uh, ways of visualizing uh, a graph's representation that we've discussed. So I, I think it's a valid way of doing it. Uh, OK. Uh, so as before, we need some way of declaring the widths of the columns that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, so we'll again be using the max vertex string length, the max edge string length. And uh, we'll have these uh, sort of helper format strings that we'll use with uh, string.format uh, to make sure that the, the table lines up correctly at the end. Um, again, we need a string builder instance. We need to label our work. This time we're printing the edges in the top row. And so this is our loop uh, for uh, creating the, the edge labels at the top. Uh, so uh, we white space this beginning part uh, with the, the vertices because that's what's on the left side. Uh, and then we white space the the top labels with the edge width, uh, the number of characters in an edge, because that's what's going on the top. Uh, okay, so then now we go row by row uh, and we iterate over the collection of vertices. Um, and uh, we specify the width of the vertex label. Uh, and then as we're going in, uh, we specify the edge width. Um, for the weights. Uh, uh, and the reason that we have two different uh, format strings here uh, is because uh, this is an integer, uh, and this uh, is a string. <laughs> and you'll get an exception if the percent, percent, you know, whatever, s uh, is declared on the integer, or if the percent d is declared on the string. Uh, and so uh, for simplicity, I've declared it just two separate helper format strings. Uh, if you can come up with a, a better way, uh, there there might be. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, OK, so now we've done it. We've created our two incidence matrix string. Let's see how that prints. Uh, OK, so we have our edge labels here. We have the cost. Uh, it seems to be printing out correctly. 
two vertices for every edge. Looks correct. Great. Uh, okay, so now uh, we need to implement prim and cruscal, and uh, we are almost officially over. Uh, so my apologies for that. Uh, okay, so cruscal. Uh, Uh, so we're actually generating a, a new graph uh, with these tree representations. So a tree is a very, it's a graph with very specific limitations. Um, but our spanning tree is indeed a new graph. Uh, so we'll return our new graph instance, uh, and it'll have a prefix of whatever our graph name is. In this case, it's G1. Uh, and then we'll give it a suffix of the algorithm used to create it. So here Skull. Uh, and then we need um, these helper data structures uh, in order to to maintain uh, what subtrees we've created uh, and uh, you know what vertices belong to which subtrees and uh, if we're adding an edge and it connects two vertices that are already part of the same tree well by the construction of the graph, we're given that it's simple, and so uh, the there's no more than one edge that connects two vertices. So if they're being connected again and they already belong to the same tree, then it means that we're violating uh, the property of being a tree. <laughs> that is, that we, we can't create these simple circuits uh, or these uh, circuits uh, in our, our tree. We have to maintain unique paths between every pair of nodes. Uh, so if they already belong to the same subtree as we're constructing it, uh, then we have to throw that edge out. Uh, and so uh, we need the ability to go in both directions. Uh, we need uh, to be able to figure out what, um, what tree we're dealing with given a, a vertex, uh, and we need to figure out what vertices are associated with a, a tree. Uh, and the root, well I've told you that there isn't a, necessarily a root that's specified, uh, the root is just going to be whatever vertex was was first given uh, <laughs> for, for that. You'll see uh, how we declare it as we go along. Uh, and then we get a familiar uh, data type here uh, that, that you all should be um, familiar with. We get a priority queue or a heap. Um, so uh, here, let me simplify each of these to pair. Well, actually, I don't want to do this one yet. Um, I can simplify that one. Uh, yeah, so there. We would have to specify these types at the end uh, if we wanted to do that. Yeah. And so here we specify a priority queue uh, and we give it a, an initial size. We tell it to expect the size to be this. Uh, and then uh, we give it a comparison function as a way of telling uh, whether or not uh, or how two edges relate to each other. Um, so uh, we take the weight of, uh, so our priority queue is going to give us the minimum weighted edge. So uh, we define it, we give the comparison function, the comparator, as Java parlance would specify, uh, and then uh, we fill it up and it'll uh, give us a, it'll handle always providing us with the minimum weighted edge. So we iterate over our collection of edges, uh, and then we add them to the queue. Uh, and then we'll pull from it later. Uh, okay, so Kruskal's algorithm tells us that we always need to uh, to consume the minimum weighted edge that does not create a circuit. Uh, so 
So, uh, and we do that by iterating over the number of vertices that we have and then consuming those edges. Uh, so we define our vertex count. It's going to be fixed. So I go ahead and declare a variable outside so that we're not constantly calling a function. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but um, I tend to be specific in that regard. Uh, okay, uh, so now uh, the way that we extract an edge uh, in Java uh, is by pulling the queue. So it's not queue.extract or queue.dq, it's uh, queue.pull. Uh, and I guess that's our next edge. Uh, and then And then uh, we should never encounter the situation where we run out of uh, edges before we run out of vertices. Um, but uh, in case it happens, uh, break. <laughs> and uh, whenever we print out the results, we'll see. But uh, we would expect this to only happen uh, if it was a, a graph with multiple connected components or uh, two completely uh, unconnected subgraphs um, or graphs which do not subgraphs which do not connect to each other uh, okay uh, so with that assumption aside <laughs> now we know that our edge is not null uh, and then uh, we get uh, the, the name of the vertex the source name of the vertex and the destination uh, vertex name uh, and then we see whether or not uh, we've already consumed that vertex whether or not it's already a participant of the graph uh, for both the source and the destination um, and so we're getting uh, if it is uh, then we'll figure out whether or not they already belong to the same subgraph and if so then we discard the edge uh, so now we have to deal with uh, a series of, of if-else statements. Uh, so the first thing that we need to handle is the case uh, where neither the source vertex nor the destination vertex is consumed. Uh, and when that's the case, uh, then we can just add it uh, because um, we don't have to worry about a circuit because we, we hadn't done anything with either the source or the, the destination. Um, so again, we're constructing a new tree. Our spanning tree is a, a new graph, uh, and so we need to be able to connect it. Uh, oh, is this complaining that we're not catching the exception? Uh, OK. Um, yeah, we'll just add a, a try-catch block here. Um, well, uh, we should never run into it. <laughs> so if it happens, uh, then the original graph um, was somehow manipulated so that uh, we had a source vertex name and a destination vertex name uh, defined as edges, which did not exist. So, so this, really, this exception really shouldn't happen. Uh, and it would be nice to be able to ignore it, but uh, we'll go ahead and forward the exception uh, because uh, we don't need a try catch block there. Uh, okay. Uh, and so that is the one downside of Java. So even though it enforces it and it says, okay, well, you should uh, always have the ability to uh, be aware that an exception may be thrown. Uh, because we've already guaranteed our data at this point, it's not, and we're constructing a graph from something that has data integrity, uh, it's not actually possible for an exception to be thrown at this point since we're copying vertex names and we're already guaranteed that they exist. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a situation that we really shouldn't have to deal with, but uh, it is enforced in Java. But, uh, anyway, it's not a big deal. Uh, okay, so then. 
Uh, in the case that neither was claimed, then we add both vertices to our new tree. We connect them via an edge. We copy the weight from the previous tree um, for the edge, the corresponding edge in the, the original tree. Uh, and then we add them to our lookups uh, so that we can refer to them later uh, to see whether or not they're already part of the graph. And it, indeed, they will be at that point. Um, so uh, if it's uh, right, uh, so the source vertex gets to be the root for, for this new subtree that's generated. Uh, and they're both part of the same subtree because they're connected by an edge. Uh, so that when we look it up, uh, we'll see that you know, they're a part of the same subtree. Uh, and then um, we uh, create a, so source is the root. So here, when we're looking up vertices associated to a given root, source is again the root. Uh, and we create a list of uh, vertices in that subtree. Uh, okay, so then the next two cases are the same, uh, but uh, with the role of source and destination swapped. Uh, so we have the case that the destination is already part of some subtree, but the source is not. Uh, and when that's the case, uh, then the source just gets attached to whatever tree the destination is associated to. Uh, so we add our new vertex because this is the first reference to source. Uh, we connect it to destination. So in this case we go from destination to source because uh, destination was already there. We could have done it in either order <laughs> as we've seen it. The order doesn't matter for these edges but um, for symmetric purposes. Destination was already there, so it extends to source. So conceptually, uh, we're, we're thinking of growing the tree in that regard. Um, then we add it to our lookups. So the root name uh, is going to be uh, whatever uh, root was associated to the destination vertex. So when we first add it, we, we add it to the vertex to root map so we can look it up here later on. Uh, and then uh, we get the, the list, this array list that we're constructing, uh, based on that root name. Uh, and then we append uh, our source, source vertex name to that list. Uh, okay, uh, and then uh, we, uh, we add the vertex to, uh, to root map. Uh, we say, okay, so now this source vertex uh, is associated with this root. So we associate uh, the vertex to the root, uh, and then the root, uh, the root to the vertex. Um, right. So we do it in both directions. Uh, okay. And now we do the same thing uh, for destination, uh, but with symmetry. So now we say, uh, okay, uh, if the source is claimed but the destination is not. Uh, then we do the exact same thing. Uh, we add the new vertex. We connect it, extending from source to destination, and copying the weight. Uh, and then we add it to our lookups. So we figure out what's the root that source is associated to. And then we get the list associated to that root. Uh, and we append our destination, our unclaimed vertex. Uh, it's now claimed by this root. Uh, and then we say, OK, well, if you want to look it up by this vertex, it's associated to this root. Uh, OK. Uh, and then if they're both uh, a part, uh, if, if they're both already participant to some uh, subtrees, to some yeah, subtrees of this graph, uh, then we have to figure out what's the deal. Are they part? Is it going to create a circuit if we include this edge? Uh, or is it, uh, is it okay to merge the two subtrees into a single one? So we figure out what root uh, is associated to the source. Uh, we figure out what root is associated with the destination. Uh, and then uh, if it's not the same, uh, then, uh, then it's fine. Then we're merging trees. If it is the same, then consuming or including that edge would create a circuit. Uh, and we can't include it. So this is the whole, this is the tricky 
scenario, uh, and this is how we enforce the uh, the property of a tree, uh, the unique paths between any pair of uh, nodes or any pair of vertices. Uh, and so, uh, in the case that they are part of different trees, then including the edge would just create a larger tree and not a circuit. Uh, okay, uh, or not a graph, which is not a tree. Uh, okay, so then uh, we connect the two vertices, and now uh, we have to uh, figure out how we're going to deal with this because uh, one tree is essentially consuming the other. So we choose, uh, we'll say, okay, well, whatever one is associated with the, the source vertex uh, is going to consume every, uh, <laughs> every node that was associated with the, the destination's root. Uh, so one of our lists is uh, shrinking and one of them is growing. The destination, the tree that was associated with the destination vertex is going away and the tree that was associated with the, uh, the source vertex is going to grow. Uh, you could add some additional logic to make sure that the smaller tree is the one that gets swallowed. Uh, I, I didn't for simplicity of code, but um, if you were to optimize this then, then you would make that choice. Uh, okay. Uh, so then uh, we have the list of the one that's going away, we add it to the list of the one that's growing, uh, and then we update our root map and uh, say that uh, for this given vertex um, it's no longer associated with the one that's going away, uh, it's now associated with the one that's uh, growing. Uh, so then we update all of our references in that case, so our lookups are still valid. Uh, and then uh, we um, root vertex map. Oh, okay. Uh, and then we just uh, remove um, the collection of vertices associated with that root name because it uh, it is no longer a root. It's been uh, superseded, uh, and so we get rid of that list. Uh, okay. Uh, so then, uh, that's it. That's all of the logic. Now uh, we can return our spanning tree. Uh, so now we uh, can see whether or not uh, Cruiskull uh, generates a, an appropriate tree. There. Uh, okay, and so now it's complaining that we don't have a try catch block associated. So let's go ahead and surround surround it with a try catch. Uh, okay, whatever. We'll do that there. We'll move these statements inside the try catch. Uh, and uh, we'll say impossible exception occurred. print out the message, and then we'll return. But we can expect that we'll never actually encounter that catch block. All the same. Uh, let's see if we have uh, an incidence matrix. Yep, this is crew skull, uh, and this is our minimum spanning tree. Uh, you can go column by column and add the weights. So 2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 24. Uh, and so uh, even though the weight is specified twice for each column, uh, it's one edge. <laughs> and so you'll see that it's duplicated within each column. Uh, so that the values are always the same. Uh, and so it's repeated per vertex, but the edge is only there once, so you only pick the value once. Uh, and so the, the total weight, when you add up each of the uh, edge weights, is 24, uh, and that agrees with what the book can, uh, computes. Uh, so now uh, we'll show how to, uh, how to implement the prim spanning tree algorithm. 
uh, and uh, then I'll let you go because <laughs> I, I will have kept you. Um, okay, uh, so uh, th this is online, so you can break it up and watch it uh, over however many days it takes. <laughs> uh, okay, um, but no, this is the the most uh, interesting. Uh, implementation we've covered so far and it makes sense that it's been the, the longest in time. Uh, so let me um, let me speed this up and I'll just uh, show you what the implementation looks like and we'll discuss it uh, and you won't have to actually wait for me to type it out. Uh, okay, does it still run? No? Has some errors? Oh. Uh, because we're not throwing an exception. Uh, okay, well, we'll deal with this one by one. Uh, okay, so, there. All right, we're not gonna be able to get the shortcut uh, that we wanted. Um, so there, well, Build it out. <laughs> we'll go slowly, uh, and uh, we'll handle the errors as uh, we try to deal with it. Uh, okay. So again, we're creating a new spanning tree based on a pre-existing graph. We'll prefix it with the name of the graph. We'll suffix it with the name of the algorithm, uh, and then that's what we return at the end. So that was rather boneheaded of me. Um, so this logic actually belongs in graph. Okay, does it run? Yes, excellent. Uh, okay, so we might be able to use this after all. Uh, so we need to include our exception. Does it run? Yes. Uh, okay, so let me walk you through the code. Uh, so uh, we're generating uh, a tree. Uh, we're going to maintain a, a lookup of vertices, and it's going to be by the name of the vertex uh, to see which vertices we've already included. Again, because uh, CrewSkull was the edge-centered approach, and uh, Prim is the vertex-centered approach. We again are going to maintain a priority queue. Uh, and then uh, we need a concept of a, a minimum edge. So we just have to pick some edge to start with. Uh, and that'll give us our first two vertices in the tree. Um, so, you know, the same as if you were looking through a, a list of integers, uh, you would have uh, some default integer uh, and then, uh, you know, comparing the, the next length, uh, in this case, or, or the weight. Uh, if anything is smaller than uh, our default, or if it's null in that case, uh, then uh, if it's null, then we just pick it as the smallest, and then after that, anything that's smaller becomes the minimum edge. Uh, and then if our minimum edge is somehow null, uh, so then uh, we're in trouble. We don't have any edges, so just return this empty tree. Uh, and that'll be it, because uh, we don't have anywhere to start with if we don't have some minimum edge. Uh, okay, so we're past that. So now, uh, both vertices, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so yeah, both vertices get included for that minimum edge. Uh, we add them here. Uh, we consume the edge, uh, because it was the one that was connecting them. Uh, and then we add them to our lookup, our vertices lookup. Uh, okay, uh, and so our for prim, we choose the smallest weighted edge uh, associated to the vertices that are already in our tree, our ever-growing tree, uh, and um, and it it looks from what we've already got to whatever would cost the least to add, uh, and it it goes based on that list. Uh, so um, so we have. Uh, 
the two edges uh, at the beginning it's just uh, sorry one edge and two vertices um, and so we say uh, okay well get the uh, for the source vertex uh, get all of the adjacent edges or all of the incident edges I should say uh, and then add them to our priority queue uh, and then exclude the one that we've already consumed uh, and then we do the same thing for the destination vertex look at all of the edges uh, and then uh, add them to our priority queue excluding the one uh, that's already connecting the the two primary vertices the two that we're starting out with uh, and we don't need to check for overlap uh, because uh, there is no overlap. There's just the one edge that joins them and then everything else that they extend to uh, for that first pair of vertices. Um, okay, uh, and so now uh, we need a placeholder because we don't get to discard edges uh, in this way. We can set them aside uh, and if it creates a circuit we can discard it because we'll never consume it again. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's possible that we'll encounter uh, some edges that we just can't consider yet. Um, I think. Uh, let's see. Uh, actually, I don't know that that's true. Yeah, I don't think we actually need the placeholder. Um, Let's delete it. Uh, so it might have been necessary in Kruskal, uh, but I think when I was uh, working through this, uh, I'd come up with some scenario where this was possible, but it's only possible in Kruskal. Here, the, the source or the destination is going to be a part of it. And that's the only time we add to the placeholder. Um, So we don't actually need that because we don't have anything in the placeholder, right? Yeah. Uh, and then we don't need it here. Uh, okay. So we'll see whether or not this works. Uh, okay. So um, if the source and the destination are already a part of the tree that we've constructed, the spanning tree that we're constructing, uh, then. Uh, we, we discard the edge, so we, we will have consumed it, we will have extracted it from the priority queue, and we're not reinserting it. Uh, and that's because it would create a circuit, if that's the case. Uh, okay, so then, if this isn't true, then it means that uh, either, uh, uh, we know that one of them has to be contained because that's how we're expanding the tree <laughs> so the edges are always associated with some vertex that's already a part of the tree uh, so then uh, if it doesn't contain the source node or the source vertex then we add it to the tree because that's the one that's getting expanded to uh, we connect it to whatever its partner was um, and then uh, uh, and we copy the weight again. Uh, so we're recreating that edge. Uh, and then we add it to our lookup table of vertices that are a part of the tree. Uh, and then uh, we look, we loop over all of the edges that are associated with that vertex. Uh, and we exclude uh, any edge that's already uh, a part of the tree. Right, uh, so um, so in that case, we can expect to only exclude uh, the the edge that extended to that tree. Uh, so it's possible that as we add these additional vertices, that we will um, uh, throw out. Well, uh, I guess not. That's that's not possible either. I was gonna say we we might be re-including edges that had already been thrown out, but uh, that won't be the case because of how we're growing the tree. Uh, okay, uh, so then, yeah, we're just um, adding to the the collection of possible next edges uh, as we reach out to the next to each new vertex. 
Uh, and then this is the exact same logic, but uh, where the, the destination or the, the other end of the edge was not already a part of the tree. Um, so then you add, add the vertex to the tree, you connect the vertices by name, copying the weight of the edge, uh, and then um, you add all of the edges to the pool of possible edges that can be consumed, uh, and then you return the spanning tree. So uh, that's the implementation. Uh, let's um, go through the trouble of printing it out. print it out. We have prim, uh, and then this is the incidence matrix. Uh, so let's take a look. Uh, 2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2. It's 24, which is the same with cruise call, and that agrees with what we had in the book. Uh, so I understand that I, I went rather rapidly <laughs> over those. Um, I will include the Java files, uh, and then you'll have to go through the work of creating the new project. Uh, I think it's a good exercise anyway. Um, but I'll include the Java files, and again, I, I would encourage you to transcribe them and, and try translating them to other languages as well. Uh, but that's the, the gist of the algorithm. Uh, I, uh, again, I will, um, I will provide the exam review uh, and you'll have a homework today as well that'll be due next Tuesday. Um, okay, uh, that's it. I'm sorry that I went half an hour over, uh, but I, um, I think it's great that we got to dive into something that was uh, uh, far and away more difficult than anything we've worked with so far uh, and you get uh, the feel of, of working with something as complex as a graph uh, which deals with these intermediate types of vertices and edges. And, um, and then algorithms that are actually acting against it. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, again, uh, I'd encourage you to, to look over the files and uh, get, your, get your hands dirty a little bit with it. And I will talk to you all on Thursday.